Hi, Craig Wilson here, and welcome to the penultimate episode of Season 3 of the Making the Media podcast. It's great to have you with us. The media industry is going through tumultuous times. I think that's probably the one continuous thread that has been throughout the podcast life. And one of the challenges being faced right now is encouraging the next generation in, widening the pool of people who want to join, and keeping those who are already here. One initiative which Avid has recently launched to support the next generation of creative talent is a new programme for students to get free copies of our award-winning editing software Media Composer, and more on that later in the episode. But within certain roles in the industry, there are significant issues right now, prompting organisations such as Screen Skills in the UK to highlight the shortages in a recent report, identifying gaps and suggesting ways the problem can be addressed. So what is the picture on the ground? In this episode, we are speaking to a leading post-production house and one of the UK's biggest creative universities. Shortly, we'll speak with Carolyn Orme, an associate professor at Ravensbourne University in England. But we'll start with Jay Cave, technical operations director of the UK-based posthouse Envy, which provides a full end-to-end post-production service and has contributed to many award-winning productions. So where does Jay see the issue at the moment? Uh, I think it is challenging. I think there are a few things that that have made it challenging. Um, The pandemic hasn't helped. Uh, We've obviously had a big gap there where people haven't been training. Uh, We haven't had the runners that we usually have because they haven't been needed during that period of time, or not so many of them have been needed. Uh, And that's created a skills gap. Um, across the industry. Um, I think the pandemic has also caused quite a few people in various guises to maybe reevaluate what they want to do with their lives. Uh, and that may be continuing to work in post production, pushing even further, or it may be doing something completely unrelated. So um, I think across the board, there's still a huge demand for content um, in various guises across different industries. Um, and, and that's obviously driving. Um, demand for for the same people that we're looking for um, in in post. So what are the areas that you're you're looking for people? Is it is it specifically around new people coming into the industry or is it across the board? Because, as you say, other people have left and moved. Um, It's across the board. Um, We're we're obviously always very keen to get the right talent in. Um, You know, it's not too difficult to find young people want to come into the industry but it's finding the right people um, and, and that's what we have to work really hard to do um, higher up the chain uh, it could be senior people from engineering to, to management in in certain areas um, that, that can be quite hard to find um, so it's not always the lower levels um, but yeah we've certainly had to work I would say a lot harder in the last year um, than ever before to, to get the right people in So when you are trying to bring the right people in, what is the, I think the skill set is one one aspect of it, but I think mindset is is another aspect of it. So so when you're bringing people in, who are the kind of people that you're looking to bring in? Yeah, I mean, from the sort of base level, uh, if you're looking at students that are maybe not had any work experience or experience of working in any workplace necessarily, um, so we're not really looking at industry experience there, we're looking at a passion for the industry as a whole. Um, ideally a passion for post-production um, if they've either done work experience with us or they've done it with someone else uh, that gives us an indication that they know they want to get into this area uh, which is always important um, and soft skills are so crucial um, and sort of more important than technical skills in most cases because we can teach people anything if they have the willingness to learn if they really enjoy learning if they can be um honest about what they know and they don't know uh well they can talk to people communicate with people um really communication isn't just a sort of producers account managers sales people um skill uh it's something we all need because uh, we're, we're always interfacing with each other and clients coming up with creative ideas um and that all needs good communication so it's, it's a really really key thing uh, that we look for it's also part of the challenge for the sort of post-production industry that so much now within the wider industry everyone's a storyteller you know there's there's you know if you look at 
pharmaceutical companies, you look at supermarkets, for example, they have got content creation departments that are looking at doing things like that. So as part of the challenge for the post industry is there's more competition for the kind of people that are coming out uh, and potentially interested in the kind of careers that you can offer. Yeah, there can be more competition. I mean, there's certainly a lot of media courses that are out there. Um, so that sort of balances out in many ways. I mean, what's been really positive in our industry over the last few years, and, and certainly what the SVODs have, have introduced is a real focus on quality. Um, and a lot of broadcasters around the world, a lot of people creating content are really focused on high end quality now. Um, and that's as a creative business like us and our creatives are really interested in that. They want to be working on great shows and putting the most they can and making it look fantastic, not just cutting corners wherever possible. Um, so that sort of drive for quality, I think, does actually help recruit people into, into our industry, you know, because they watch Netflix at home, they watch Apple TV at home, you know, they, they want to be involved in that work. Let's hear from Carolyn now on her role at Ravensbourne and the work they're doing to bring through the next generation of creative talent. Well, Ravensbourne is a specialist kind of creative institution um, and it's really a, a, a wonderful place and a kind of hotbed for creative, aspiring creative um, practitioners. And we have many courses within uh, Ravensbourne that factor things like, um, of course, broadcasting, I'm going to say, TV and film, um, as well as engineering and, and post-production, as well as sound um, post-production and sound and music. What's so unique is that because they're all creative, they all kind of feed off each other in a way. And there's such a strong interplay within the creative industries. There's lots of room there for overlap as well. How do you work with industry to make sure that the people that you're training are coming through into the industry and then there are you know jobs available for them to go into? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a really important question, and it's something that we've been working on. I mean, because it's always been a big interest of ours, um, and we we work really hard at covering many different facets within post production, so that students leave with a very strong skill set um, within lots of different aspects within post production, so that then that can be a springboard into for that for that student to work out what particular career that they can move into. Now, the key thing really as an educator is to provide many different areas, but to also tap into the area that the student is most interested. And so, typically, what we find is lots of students have different interests. So. That interest could be subject specific, like they're very interested in history or sports or, um, you know, or music or politics. So then, you know, one question you have to ask the student is what's your area of specialism or area of interest? But then the second thing is what kind of craft could you see yourself within? And as I said, there's so many different job roles out there and what will suit one won't necessarily suit another. You mentioned there about the sort of diversity of roles that are available within the, the sort of wider media industry. And there's even new roles that are being developed that, you know, 10, 15 years ago didn't, didn't really ex exist. Is, is that, you know, it's great in some ways for the student, but it's also a challenge for the media industry because people are looking for different pathways and different careers then perhaps, you know, I go in, I want to be an editor, and I come out, and that's what I'm going to do. Whereas, you know, people might go in saying, I want to be an editor, but they come out actually, and what I want to be is I want to be an edit supervisor, for example, um, or I want to work in post-production in a different kind of role. So it's one of the challenges about there's there's so much choice and option that it's actually becoming a little bit challenging for the industry to then fulfill some of the roles. Yeah, well, that's it. I think, you know, I, I was thinking about it. I think sometimes the reasons why sometimes companies might have difficulties recruiting is because of the variety of roles that are out there. Um, it means that um, obviously you've got less amount of people going for one particular role, because if you have 30 new roles out there, if you're if you're trying to um, attract um, somebody for a particular role, of course, there's all these other roles that are competing for people as well within that very same sector. And in a way, it's great that students have got this kind of choice, but it makes it very difficult for the companies. Um, 
but also I think it's you know a lot of the time these positions of becoming you know a full-time editor whether that's online or an editor a craft offline editor for drama or documentary it takes about 10 years really for students to get to that place or position and they were very aware of it that they need to progress through the roles of runner machine control assistant second assistant you know first assistant assembly editor and for, uh, if you think about it from a student who's invested a lot in in their education they want their money back and their returns for that so there's equally that pressure for a student once they leave to actually pay that money back as well so you know maybe the models that are out there within this sector is not why is has not really caught up with what's actually happening in terms of you know the the financial implications of studying for a young person and what they want to you know they want to move they basically want to move quite fast into these roles and they're very keen to and it is also the case that there are other creative industries or industries which are linked to the creative community where it is easier to perhaps progress more quickly into these kind of positions. Yeah, exactly. So um, so what we're seeing now is, of course, we've got the terrestrial channels, we've got the Channel 4, we've got the BBC, we've got um, Sky, but of course we've got all the streaming services. So we've got Amazon and Netflix and all these competing different platforms and providers. Um, but of course, within all of these mainstream media, they'll also they all have a division that is to do with social media and of course that's also these gaps in the industry of where content needs to be filled um, within social media means that these become areas that students are then moving into um, and of course that takes away some of the talent into other areas um, of, of social media where things are being reversioned or packaged or made into smaller um, uh, bite-sized chunks for, for, for social media. Um, so th 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 there's these areas that are growing. But of course, what I've noticed as well is that every company now, you know, are potentially a storyteller. So, you know, body shop, any big, you know, pharmaceutical company will have a kind of media arm or or will distribute their own media or content. So, of course, there's all these competing areas as well where, um, you know, content has been created everywhere. Um, so I've looked at kind of new roles that are out in the industry and I was searching and I was looking. There's things like brand manager, di digital content creators, um, you know, digital programming coordinators, versioning producers. I mean, it, it just goes on and on, these these other roles. Um, creative direction, sorry, creative directors, uh, motion editors, um, you know, these kind of um, new roles are kind of opening and and because of that, it's it means that <laughs> there's all these platforms and, and things that are coming about. It is an industry that's known for long hours. It can involve lots of travel, depending on different things that, that people are working in. And I'm wondering whether the industry is doing enough to try to replace those people who have left and, and is doing enough to encourage people from more diverse backgrounds to perhaps come into the industry as well. Is that something that you see that, that more needs to be done? I think more can be done. Um, we pride ourselves in doing a lot of work within widening participation and and, and really um, creating a kind of positive representation and improving on this year on year and and creating um, you know these pathways into industry that help people get into industry and get in through the door and to to um, build that link with industry so we have a work placement course a work placement uh, module in our second year and this is great for our students because you know this is an opportunity for our students to apply to companies and get in on work placements and um and also we also have really good links with industry so nearly every single post-production company we have links with so um you know if they have opportunities they get in contact with us and with our um uh, the people that uh, coordinate um jobs and and jobs portal um that is then accessible to our students which is a great mechanism to for you know that all students can apply for these opportunities um, within these companies and that's a great way to get new talent into companies so we do quite a lot of work at Ravensbourne to try and 
open up uh, these channels to get people into these companies that wouldn't normally get into these companies. Um, and we we push it, you know, strongly. But I think companies could do more. I think um, obviously Screen Skills is doing a lot in terms of looking at work placements and placements that are financed. Um, so I think partnerships and funding within work placements are great because it means that because obviously people can't afford to do it for nothing that, you know, it it helps if they're they're paid. But these kind of channels are excellent, you know, work placements um, that are paid um, that can then enable students to start and move into these companies. And then it, it just starts with being in that company and then people see people's potential and then they they move on up. So um, we we have a lot of students that move into the industry that, um, that will, you know, that 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 is changing this, you know. Um, but certainly, I think companies can do a lot more. They can do things like look at their marketing strategies, look at their human resources, look at um, areas that, um, that that is attractive so that if a, a person is looking at their website, they can see that there's people like themselves in key roles, you know, that the, there's a culture within the company of, you know, openness that is 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 that likes a mixed workforce, you know. Um, and I think that's good because it all means a successful company. Training isn't just a preserve of the educational community, though. Here's Jay talking about the work of the Envy Academy. We started Envy Academy a long time ago, 2008. Um, it was really, for us, we've been an expanding company for quite a long time. We've got five buildings now. Uh, we just acquired another business, uh, which would be building number six. Um, so there's a huge demand for staff. Um, we really try our best to recruit from within and we need to find the right people. So the idea of the academy is to outreach to universities. Um, just so far this year, we've had 12 events, um, so more than one a month um, around the country, talking to different colleges, universities, educational institutions, everyone really that is interested in learning about post-production. So we go there, we engage with people directly, teach them about all the roles that may not know exist, um, how post-production works, um, what future they could have, what different paths they could take from technical to creative to a mixture of the two, um, help them writing CVs and, and learning how to get their step, you know, their foot in the door. So it's it's sort of a big outreach program where we're helping people as much as possible. Obviously, on the backside of that, where we're looking at staff and, and enticing people to come and work for us, whether that's in in sort of work experience placements that are quite short that then move on to, to more permanent work um, um, or just sort of direct recruitment. But it's been really good for us to find the best students out there, uh, really good for us to help educate people about what post actually is um, and what it isn't and, and what the, the sort of the process is for someone starting. How long are they going to be doing this and this and this and where can they get to and how long might that take? Um, so some of it is a bit of a dose of reality to students, uh, but it's very positive. Uh, and ultimately, we want you know everyone to be informed, everyone to be learning the right thing at university, understanding what skills they need to get under their belt before they start applying. Um, and then we want people to succeed. So it's, it's really positive for us. Um, so far, just this year, in the last six months, we've had 10 runner promotions directly from runner into, into more senior roles at Envy. Um, a lot of our senior creatives have come from those positions, colorists, online editors, uh, heads of department have all been in those positions in the past at Envy. Um, so we're really good at retaining good staff um, and we're really good at internal promotion, but that does take a lot of outreach to achieve that. You know, it's, it's a lot of work. We have a team dedicated to this. Uh, that's really what they do. Um, and we take 120 students per year through work experience schemes. Uh, just one week each, give them a flavour um, of what they might get if they join a facility like ours, um, get them to talk to some creatives, get some experience in different departments in that time period. Um, and, you know, so far, those 120 places are really filled for this year. So, um, you know, there is a lot of demand there uh, and it enables us to find the right people. But where we've taken that further um, over the last year is we've now taken that internally. Um, we've hired a staff development manager whose job it is solely to train staff, to organise training, um, 
to make time for people in regards to training specifically, um, which up to that point has more been ad hoc. It's more been department managers doing that when they can, which is great in the months that they're not so busy, but harder in the months where they really are busy. Um, and I think in the past, we've also suffered from maybe only seeing the people that are particularly vocal, you know, seeing the people that are particularly outgoing, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, great to have some outgoing people in post. Um, but sometimes you can ignore those people that speak out a bit, a bit less. So having someone that's actually going to meet every single person of the team in all departments every month, talk to them about what their goals are, if their goals are changing, what they need experience with, what they're worried about. Um, has just been really positive and sort of takes that academy brand uh, right through to people getting promoted. So um, that's really a reaction to us needing to get people through faster. Ultimately, you know, we need to we've got a lot of roles to fill um, all the time uh, as we expand and, and get more work in. Um, so uh, we can't really wait too long uh, to get people through and get people promoted. Yeah, there's a couple of things that you said there, Jay, that I want to ask a little bit more about. Um, one thing that you mentioned was explaining to people about the roles that exist within the industry. Yeah. Because I think from, from the outside looking in, people don't necessarily see the importance of some of the technical roles that perhaps exist, being a media manager, a data wrangler, for example, managing the infrastructure. So there are many more roles there. Is that something that you see as important? Is like we have to spread the message about there's actually lots of opportunities in lots of different types of roles. It's not just the classic, I want to come in and be an editor. Yeah, exactly. And that is really hard. Uh, I think audio is very well known as a path because there's obviously lots of connections there with, with music and, and with other areas outside of post uh, where mixing is important. Um, editing is also up there with something people know about, um, but do they know online editors exist and what they do? Probably not <laughs> in most cases. Um, <clears throat> also, I would say management is quite a hard thing that people from media courses specifically don't necessarily know is a goal um, or could be a goal for them or could be something really interesting for the right character. Um, you know, that could be department heads, that could be running department heads. You know, there's, there's a big scope there for the right people that understand things technically and creatively, but actually really like managing uh, the process and the workflow. Um, so those are areas that tend to get missed a bit in courses, uh, I feel, uh, and also in those sort of understanding of students before they arrive. So part of us doing the work experience and, and doing the outreach is trying to explain what all these options are um, because we all seem to spill those roles too. I mean, the same for engineering, like pure technical roles that go more on the engineering side. Um, you know, we, we do a lot in promoting people internally to that, but they don't really know those roles exist before they start. It's something they just sort of realise they're interested in and then they move across to. The other um, aspect I wanted to pick up on there was about internal training and the value you see in bringing people in, training them, and then, you know, progressing in their careers. How important is that to an organisation like N? It's hugely important. I mean, really, most of our staff have either started with us um, at, as runners or they've started another facility in that position. Um, and they've only really got to where they've got to through training. Um, we have a lot of staff and a lot of people, so we sort of track that in quite a formalised way. We track training hours for, for everyone and where they're training. Uh, we track what they're doing and what their goals are. Uh, we get people to sign off their skills um, based on, on where they think those individuals are and give them feedback so they can improve certain skills in certain areas. So it, it's, it's quite formalised at our size because we have to be. Um, but it's really central to being able to, to deliver the services that we do because it's ever changing. We, we've always got to learn things. It's not that you sort of get to a certain level and then you don't need training anymore. Uh, you know, everyone needs training in something. I do, um, you know, every level. So um, it's it's super crucial. I mean, the pandemic opened up things like remote working for for a lot of people as, um, as well. Do you think that's also, though, had an impact because people have not had the opportunity to be in an office, to be in that creative environment, to 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 Im immerse themselves, if you like, in those soft skills that are very, very important for the industry as well. Yeah, very much. I mean, remote's been fantastic for people that are senior um, because it gives them flexibility in their lives, but, um, but it doesn't help the more junior people um, learn. So a balance is, is crucial. We certainly have people that work remotely, but we're very keen for people to work on site 
um, part of the week um, because we need to train the next generation. And uh, you can only, I mean, you can learn in various ways. You can obviously learn online, but it's not the same as looking at someone's shoulder, looking at what they're doing, asking ad hoc questions because you're just in the same room as them. Um, you know, sitting in with editors and colorists and mixers is really crucial for these young people to understand what they want to do, you know, how that person interacts with clients. Oh, God, that's a skill I need. Um, that's, I mean, interacting <laughs> with clients and be able to manage a room. If you're a colorist and you've got eight people in a room all with different opinions and you've got one day to do your job, how do you manage that? I mean, that's a big skill. You're not even going to know that's a skill unless you spend time in the room. Um, so yeah, it, it's crucial. And, and we've lost a lot of time in the pandemic from sort of having a lack of that. Um, and it's really great that, that a lot of people want to come back in and start working in person. There's also a recognition that it's vital that people are trained on the tools used within the industry. So what's Carolyn's view of the new free media composer for students program? This is absolutely fantastic. I think, um, you know, um, What's been great over the years is this ability for young people to move into these creative areas. Um, it's always been there's always been a massive barrier historically. I mean, 20 years ago, a lot of this software was not free, was very expensive, and, and you couldn't get your hands on this kind of technology, you know, for love or money. You know, it, it was impossible for lots of people to kind of learn this software, um, you know lots of different types of software there is that, that is available for young people it means that they can learn these tools and then it gives them and they can build a show reel or they can build a craft um, and so avid uh, joint and um, doing this it's it's been really timely um, because a lot of our students are very keen to learn this software and um, it's happened at the right time because people have been asking uh, time and time again for for it to be free because obviously you know, their fees are so expensive, you know, it's just one extra cost that you can do without. This really helps. And I think they're going to see, you know, uh, they'll benefit so greatly from this, because of course, if students leave with that software and that skill set, um, of course, they'll be going into these companies ready to, um, to hit the ground running with these skills. Um, and so we, you know, currently, uh, I teach the AVID 101, I'm an AVID certified instructor. And uh, we are an AVID learning partner and we do um, run the AVID 101. So I think increasingly we're going to see more people doing it and, and succeeding with it, with having the software for free. And it just means as well, um, because a lot of big post-production companies use AVID, it basically means that um, there'll be more students that will be ready to take these opportunities if they've got those skills. So, you know, if there is a skills gap, um, this hopefully will help to 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 make sure that it fills that skills gap if students and leave with those skills and will move more into the long form with those skills. Um, and uh, this is great. This is great for us and it's great for the students. Time now then for the question I ask everyone on the podcast. So first for Caroline and then from Jay, what is it, if anything, that keeps them up at night? <laughs> I was thinking... It's an interesting one because obviously, you know, the nighttime is such an interesting moment because, you know, it's dealing with the subconscious. Um, and of course, it's such an creative, important part. And I often say to uh, my partner, wouldn't it be nice if I could um, dream about little uh, pink, fluffy clouds and, uh, and, and you know, uh, kind of unicorns and uh, lovely things. But often it, there will be some kind of working <laughs> anxieties. <laughs> Or some kind of worry around, have I done this? Have I done that? You know, um, but yeah, um, or some kind of role playing out, you know, um, which is always interesting. I sleep very well. Um, I would say the only thing that actually keeps me up at night is my my youngest demanding a chaperone to the bathroom, even though he's perfectly capable of sorting that out himself. Um, that's the main thing. But apart from that, I sleep quite well. Ah, the joys of parenthood. Uh, thanks to both Jay and Caroline for contributing to this episode. Now, if you want to find out more about AVID's new free Media Composer for Students programme, then check out the show notes or just go to the Media Composer webpage on the avid.com site and look for the Free for Students tab. Also in the show notes is a link to an episode of the podcast from earlier this season where we discussed the issue of skills previously. 
Now, don't forget to like, leave a comment, share and subscribe to the podcast on your platform of choice. And what do you think about what we discussed? Let us know. I'm on social. My user is craigaw1969 on both Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email us. We are making the media at avid.com. Thanks to Jay and Caroline. Thanks to our producer, Matt Diggs. And thanks, of course, to you for listening. For me, Craig Wilson, that's all for this episode. One more to go in season three before we take a summer break. I hope you can join us then for another in-depth discussion about making the media. Hold up. 